It's time to make sports talk great again with Kurt Schilling and Steve Dace. And greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Blaze TV. I am Steve Dace. He is World Series champion, Hall of Famer in waiting, Kurt Schilling. We put 25 minutes on the clock and we talk sports each and every day. Get to as many of the day's sports topics in that amount of time as we possibly can. Why that amount of time? It's because the consultants tell us that uh, that's about the longest we can expect any of you troglodytes to actually tune in if you're tuning in at all. How are you doing, Kurt? I'm good. Are you ready Busy to go? Weekend. Yeah. All right. Let's get it going. Put 25 minutes on the clock beginning now. I hate to do this to you. We have some late breaking news. I don't know if you saw this or not. Fallout continuing from uh, the, the academic scandal at USC. Did you see this news? I have not seen. Yeah. They, uh, the, the, the administration there, they've cleaned everybody out. Coach, football coach, Clay Helton, whole staff gone. Athletic director, Lynn Swan gone. Urban Meyer has been brought in as head football coach and athletic director at USC. I think a lot no. of people thought this is how it, the story was eventually going to end, but your wow. thoughts on that news here uh, wow. in the middle of April? Like, well, uh, like, I, like, I, like, I, like April 1st. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Well done. You got me. You got me. <laughs> You got me. You know, it's, uh, I put this out on Twitter today. Aaron started tech. Our producer, Aaron, w- was like, damn it. I was going to have to. I thought I had to change the whole rundown. You got I, me, too. I, you got me. I was getting ready to, to get upset about Lynn Swan as my former Steeler. <laughs> but uh, well done. Uh, but would it, you know, here's the thing. You know why that's a good troll? It's believable, isn't it? No one believes exactly Urban Meyer left coaching for health. No, that's exactly why it's a good yeah. show, because it's 100% believable. Right. It's it's an outcome everybody expects we will eventually get to. Uh, maybe just not on April the 1st. Maybe more like December well, the 1st. Thank you for actually making that happen this morning because now I know today I won't I won't uh, I won't get sucked in there you go all right well let's get to the real news not the fake news we're hashtag fake news here on we talk sports today at least let's get to the real news and then there were four uh one of the best maybe the best round of elite eights I can ever remember you know I mean we we I, I don't know that we had a <laughs> that's going to be the greatest college basketball game probably in my lifetime, the Duke Kentucky regional final of 1992. But I mean, we had several that are, were instant classics. The, the game that, uh, that Carson Edwards and basically Carson Edwards versus Virginia, uh, in that regional final, uh, was incredible. I mean, he was literally taking two dribbles past half court and just draining three point shots. Uh, that regional final was incredible. Auburn's Kentucky, come back against Kentucky with their best player, their leading scorer and rebounder, out with the knee injury, and they come back and they they force overtime. Uh, and and, a, and and really, congratulations to Auburn on a Final Four that they will likely uh, it's their first ever, and they will likely soon be vacating it. My guess is, within the next twelve to eighteen months, uh, Auburn will technically still have never been uh, to a Final Four uh, in the NCAA record books, but their fans can at least celebrate celebrate a hell of a win uh then the, the duke michigan state game lived up to the hype duke played three straight final possession games uh in the ncaa tournament uh that came down to the last shot against central florida and then against virginia tech and then against michigan state uh really just uh and and the texas tech and zaga games kind of being lost as well and that yeah. game was going down to the buzzer too until you saw a boneheaded play by one of the Gonzaga players you don't typically see slapping at the ball on an inbounds that led to a technical foul that that basically ended that game. But until that play, that game looked like it was going to go down to the last 30 seconds as well. Uh, an incredible weekend of NCAA tournament action we had by median seed, the best Sweet 16 of all time. Uh, and then all these higher ranked teams playing each other that last weekend, it lived up to the hype, Kurt. Yeah, no. I mean, we talked the other day about the, the that rest period that we thought I thought made some games uh, come out uh, teams come out rusty, and and uh, there was none of that this weekend. They uh, it lived up to the hype, and brackets everywhere were broken uh, with with the Duke defeat, uh, which is a wonderful thing. But I do I, I am fired up that your your nightmare scenario is still alive uh, because Michigan State still has a chance to win it all. Michigan State and Virginia was my national championship pick. If you go back the Monday after Selection Sunday, all the trends we gave you do not pick more than two number one seeds. How many number one seeds are in this Final Four? One. 
right? Almost all these trends we gave you held up. And for those who say, uh, and, and as a result, by the way, I'm in the 90th percentile out of 17 million plus brackets at ESPN. Um, I'm in the 90th at percentile in terms of accuracy. And in terms of 3.1 million brackets at Yahoo, I'm in the five percent. I'm in the 95 percentile. Same bracket for those of you because it's a sheet of integrity. Never forget that. Dude code demands this. Uh, but it's the same sheet. It's just the same amount right with fewer uh, competitors. Um, means I'm just higher. That's all. You know what really ticked me off, though? Is that Kentucky fold at the end and Auburn's comeback to force overtime really screwed me because I the, the one the one pool I decided to pay to get into I haven't paid to get into a pool in twenty years since like college all right and I paid to get into the handicappers pool at pregame.com and if and, and if Kentucky had gone to the final four. There's a realistic shot I could have finished as high as second in that one uh, with the Virginia-Michigan State title and Virginia winning up against all the, the uh, professional handicappers there. No, I, I mean, well, yeah, it's, a bra- it's my bracket. It's, it's oh, picking okay. the bracket. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So if Kentucky had won, I would have had three of the final four and then a realistic shot at the national championship game. I could have finished as high as second in that contest against uh, all of the other uh, handicappers. And for the tournament, I'm trying to remember what my record is off the top of my head. I think it's 57 and something like that. 57, 23 and two. Yeah. Is that what it is? There right. it is. Yeah, there it is. I did remember it. My bad. I forgot. There it is. Yeah. 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 57, I, I, 23 and two against the spread um, in the NCAA tournament. Your thoughts on that, Kurt? I'm not going to give you my thoughts on this. Give me a break. That's like me trying to remember how many strikeouts I had in my career. Which you seem right. to instantly recall a couple of days ago, I, I seem to remember right. here on the show. Right. right. Yeah, no, no, you, then uh, you needed to look at me and say, and your thoughts on that, Steve. Right. Uh, that's pretty good, though. It's pretty good. We're going to have a lot more angles on this uh, throughout the course of the week. It was an incredible weekend of college basketball. And by the way, for those who say the regular season doesn't matter. You have the regular season Big 12 champion, the regular season Big 10 champion, the regular season ACC champion, all in the final four, the fourth team. For those of you that say the conference tournaments don't matter, the fourth team was the SEC tournament champion, Auburn. So there you go. And then there's going to be a lot of talk of one and dones. This could very well be the last one and done final four we get. My guess is we'll have one more. They probably can't change the rules in the NBA uh, fast enough to impact next year's draft with so many of the 2020 recruits already spoken for. But we are coming to the end of the one-and-done era that began in 2006. And we have some interesting trend lines now in terms of, you know, when this era first began, it looked like the teams that went all in on these one-and-dones were going to dominate. But as we have gone further and further, again, chemistry, experience. You saw this yesterday in the Michigan State Duke game. There were several players at the end where Duke just had a guy drop a pass where a guy just threw a bad ball, all right? And in the end, they were the team, would they have 18, 19 turnovers in that game? You know, I mean, Michigan State doesn't have a player on its roster. They've got the Big Ten Player of the Year. They don't have a player on their roster right now that is considered a lock early entry to the NBA draft. All right, Cassius Winston, everybody thinks he's coming back for his senior year because he's not like on the top 75 of any draft board. All right. So if you were if we were sitting in a schoolyard and we were picking up teams, like probably the first three or four picks would all be Duke players. But right. but when the sum is when you put start you know doing the sum total of the parts there, the amount of even the last play of the game there, the way Winston faked Duke out and then zigged and zagged and got the ball and ran out the clock again. That's a crafty senior junior who's played a lot of games against guys that are just used to physically dominating teams. So we're going to talk a lot about that uh, later in the week as well. Let's get to some baseball. And I want to just let our audience know, I'm going to dip my toe in the water of baseball handicapping, which I don't know anything about. So I'm going to take baby steps this season, Kurt. I'm I'm going to play two trends and only two trends all year. I'm going to take teams playing the final game of a series uh, that's of three to four games if they're trying to avoid a sweep in the last game, all right? And then I'm going to take teams that are on a six-game losing streak or more. Those are the only two trends I'm going to play, and I'll be curious to see how tight the lines are in those particular trends. And Because what, what I'm probing for to start with is where, where is the soft spot? Because there's always one, all right? right. And, and normally Vegas isn't worried about 
um, having a soft spot exposed by a few of the sharper handicappers because for every sharper handicapper that'll be disciplined to play a soft spot, 10,000 people won't will, won't be disciplined right. and we'll just go in and play their favorite team and favorite play, pitcher, okay? So the second trend doesn't apply yet because we haven't played six games in the regular season yet, okay? The first trend actually had three teams yesterday that were trying to avoid sweeps uh, on, on of three to four game sweeps on the last day. Those teams went one and two against the spread. So right. each week on this show, I'll keep the audience throughout the course of the baseball season updated on how this uh, my initial attempts to, to find out how baseball handicapping works. Uh, we'll get to that. Let's get to the games themselves. Well, you the want to comment on that? Go ahead. Need, I was going to say, people need to understand you have to play every game. Mm -hmm. that, that's a trend that you can't pick and choose. Right. And, and I'm going to be very curious to see because you're going to end up it's going to end up being, I, I think it'll end up being closer to 60%. I, I think that's true, actually. I think yeah. it will be closer to 60% as well. Because again, most people aren't, there's a reason why when we were doing the rollover pick for you in college football, you know, you essentially got labeled a sharp playing my pick uh, and, and they started capping what you could bet. All right. Yep. Because for every person like me, that you find in college football, you're going to find 10,000 that are just going to bet their favorite team, the number one team. And that's where the, that's where the Vegas guys make all their money. All right. Yep. So when they find people that know what they're doing, they, they, they single them out and cap what they can, what they, how much they can play and, and, and make all their money off of, uh, you know, the average Joe schmuck out there basically. Right. So well, uh, that's yeah. why I'm starting with these two trends. Um, and because I, I also want to see how tight the lines are, because not always, by the be, way, like the Braves were favored yesterday. Yeah. Uh, going into the last game of that series with the Phillies and and lost the game. So not always is the team trying to avoid the sweep even going to be an underdog. Keep that in mind. All right. Well, and that's the thing that to see how much you're going to be up at the end of the year is really going to it's going to kind of require a little luck in the pitching matchups. You're mm -hmm. going to need to have. The Nationals with Scherzer at huge odds going for a sweep and getting beat in that last game. Right. Those are the games you're going to have to count. But again, I think you're going to look at a 60 plus percent win rate at the end of the season. Let's get to the games themselves. I don't know, man. This, this could be the greatest opening week anybody's had in the history of this game. <laughs> Christian Yelich serving some notice. Last year's uh, arrival on the scene was no fluke. All right, and that he is here to stay. Here is some of the elite company he is already in this season. Uh, he joined Willie Mays. That's good company. Mark McGuire. Nelson Cruz. One day we may debate whether he's going to end up in the Hall of Fame or not. Okay. Chris Davis and Trevor Story as the only players in Major League Baseball history to homer in the first four games of a season. He also joined Barry Bonds and Albert Pujols as the only players to ever homer the first two games of a season after winning an MVP, and you may be shocked that it's only those two guys, but I would imagine, A, when you win the MVP, you come in the next week, the opening next weekend, and everybody's thinking, I've got a bullseye on that guy, right? Okay, so your, your thoughts on the opening, and then, oh, by the way, then he hit the, uh, uh, then he, you know, hit the, the walk-off yesterday, I think, for the Brewers, yeah. right? So, Christian Yelich, greatest opening week ever for a player um, in the history of baseball? I haven't seen many that would touch it. Um, I, I got to tell you, yesterday's uh, get, the first home run yesterday. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Uh, he hit the fastball middle in and up. Um, the, the whole start is amazing. And and one of the amazing things about this is, I'm not sure you understand how how physically different this kid is. He is a monster of a young man. He he's in six four six five. He's very tall, uh, lanky. Um, another. Uh, proof positive that that strength is not uh, a power in baseball. Power is uh, a flexibility and mm -hmm. and range of motion. But I got to tell you, the home run he hit yesterday, the, there was a fastball up and in, and I remarked as soon as he hit it that uh, I'm not I'm not as in awe of the home runs as I am in him hitting that pitch. Left handers don't hit that pitch. It's just not a pitch you ever ever are worried about lefties hitting out. And not only did he hit it out, but he hit it out to the pull side of the field. Um, I think one of the reasons why I love the Brewers this year was because of him, and I think he he hasn't let us down. Uh, I, it was an interesting opening weekend. No bigger story than him. Um, I don't know how this trans. I mean, obviously everybody's going to be telling you what kind of a home run pace he's on, right? But 
Let's talk about what it means for maybe the Brewers. You know, we talked a lot about them last week on our uh, preview shows. We went right. through the win totals. We talked about there's th- that a lot of the pros are fading the Brewers heading into the year. Um, you and I are kind of the contrarians there. We, we both think we don't see a team that really lost any key players from a year ago. Um, and we actually might have been, I might have been inclined when the win total was up to 88. I might have been inclined to say, okay, I'll go under. But after it drops a game and a half, and now you've told the team with this many returning guys from a year ago that you suck and, and you're going to take a back seat in that division all throughout spring training, I, I would imagine there's a motivational factor there. And then if if you were doubting at all, you know, where your your team is at, you know, you may feel like you have that swagger, but until the games start counting in the standings, right? You don't really know for sure. To see your guy. The guy that, you know, is really your linchpin. He's your cornerstone. To see him just come out and serve notice like that in the opening week, he's not going to keep up that pace. He's he's a human being, right? But in terms of what it does for the esprit de corps of the Brewers as a team and the message it sends about how you want to start a season, you've been in this situation as a player. What's that clubhouse like right now? Um. I, I can tell you that a couple times that 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 I went to the postseason, uh, and people might find this hard to believe, the first three or four games of the season were the reason that you knew. Uh, in 93, we swept the Astros coming out of, of uh, spring training when they had signed uh, big free agents that winter. And we did so in the last game on a walk-off. Uh, uh, well, a, a ninth-inning homer, actually, on the road. Um, and on the plane flight back, it was it was just different. We knew. We knew in spring training they had an idea. Uh, but you got to play it out, mm-hmm. and I think that I think that they leave this weekend feeling very, very good about themselves. And this is a a momentum thing that can carry on for six months. And, and as long as they stay healthy, I see no reason why it wouldn't. You know, I've quoted this before, and sometimes you know um, it, it's it's hidden in plain sight. One of the smartest pieces of analysis about the Major League Baseball season I've ever heard. And it goes back to the 2005 White Sox uh, when they won their World Series. And Ozzie Guillen, the manager, uh, and I'm sure there were several words bleeped out, uh, you know, included in this uh, uh, dime store uh, wisdom uh, from uh, from Mr. Guillen. But when people were doubting those that White Sox team that year with the the start they got off to. And, you know, uh, well, things will even out. They'll regress to the mean. And he said something that has stuck with me ever since. He said, Curdy said, every game we won in April and May is a game we don't have to win when it's harder in August and September. Yep. And I never really looked at it like that before. You know, you know? and I think there is, particularly when you're in a division as competitive as this one, you know, there is kind of something to that, Right. In terms of, you know, would you rather get off to a great start or not? Is it easier to come back from a terrible start or is it easier to sustain a good one? I would imagine it's probably easier to sustain a good one, right? Particularly in the in the, in, in the division as competitive as the National League Central. Let's go there next, and or let's stay there next. Uh, what's the Cubs' concern level here? You Darvish, their $126 million man, hasn't pitched since last May. They threw him out there yesterday against his old team, the Rangers. Um Walked seven guys, Kurt, in two and two thirds innings on just seventy-five pitchers. That well, I mean, so talking about the Brewers, you can't help but make uh, mention of this. The, one of the reasons why we picked the Brewers um, was that I don't think we felt that the Cubs. I, I, I felt the Cubs were going to be good, um, and that I think they will be. But this has to be a huge problem because no, I don't think anybody saw this coming, um, and. Walking seven guys in a game, I, I don't know. I've never done it, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, but but there's concern. There's there's concern in Chicago. Um, in your day, would you have lasted long at that long enough? When if your stuff was that bad, would you have lasted in a game long enough to to do that, or would you have been yanked? Well, if I walked the seventh guy in the seventh inning, maybe right. Right, I mean, seven guys in what three less than three innings. When you take put put our average viewer listener on the pitching mound, seventy five pitches, you're walking seven guys. 
right? We talked last year. The remember the pitching line, one of the one of the last dominant starts Chris Sale had, or maybe it was actually the start when he came back from the DL. Actually, now I think about it, when he was on a five inning pitch count, and he struck out ten guys on like eighty pitches or something in, yeah. in five innings, right? And we marveled yeah. at the efficiency of that. Well, this is the total opposite. What is what's going on with a pitcher this early in the year when the bat the heat the batters aren't heated up and everything yet either? You're this wild. What's going on in the mound there? Well, it, you're trying to get off the mound as quickly as you can, honestly, um, because you, you you're you're upset, but you're also embarrassed and you're feeling bad for the guys playing behind you because they're sitting out. It, it, this is the worst possible thing you could do. This is one of those things where if he doesn't come back next start and 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 isn't the guy that he's supposed to be, then I'm concerned. If he comes, if he's wild as next, this could be. Listen, he hasn't pitched in a long time, mm-hmm. so there could have been a lot of different things going on mentally, nerves, and whatever. Here's so I'll two give things. him one stinker. Here's here's me as the ham and egger here. You know, as uh, the, 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 you're the you're the sharp in this sport. I'm the square. The thing that bothers me as as, as the square observer here is he's got two, uh, on top of eager to get out there and earn his check, I'm sure, all right, with missing basically an entire calendar year now between April and, and last May. You've got two added extra incentives. One, you're going up against your old club. Yeah. And then two, your current team stakes you to a three-run three lead. Well, the three-run lead's not even a factor because you're not you're not good enough to even consider that being one of the things you're upset about. Okay. When you can't throw strikes, you're not thinking about score of the game. You're thinking about survival. Well, that, I brought but, that up from the context of if you had motivation and you should feel oh, relaxed, yeah. no, no, no. right? The bigger motivation for me is against the former team. Mm-hmm. That's why I expected him to be sharp yesterday. I mean, it's a tough ballpark to be sharp in when you're getting hit around. A former team but, with a win total of 71, by the way. Right, yeah. right. And I, I, yeah. No, and I... I uh, that was I, there was a lot of reasons why I expected him to throw well, and none of them came into fruition yesterday. I did want to mention too. I think our Oriole over under took a huge hit this week. You do, yes. I I I didn't see that. I, I you don't I, want to I, overreact, expect- but when the win total is fifty nine, there's not a lot of margin. There's not a lot of error margin for error. <laughs> I would have bet. I honestly would have bet that they would not have taken two out of three from the Yankees at any point during the season. So even if the Yankees brought up uh, the Triple A team, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, even, I, I, even if, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. The, now I, I want to go back to, before we leave the Darvish thing. You were going to make a point about his next start, and I think I rudely interrupted you. I want to let you finish that point about what the what, what's hinging on his next start from a his season next career start, standpoint. You be able to throw strikes. The, mm-hmm. the the wildness. Oh, again, you can throw a lot of different things in for that opening day. Uh, it also tells me that uh, I'm not a big fan of his going into the postseason because this is an adrenaline filled mm-hmm. start that usually you should be come out. You know, you, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I missed uh, about a year, came back in my first start. I went seven and punched out 10 and gave up one hit. And, and everybody was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you were throwing. I was the adrenaline was there, that postseason adrenaline. And I, I would argue that he had it yesterday. And this is what you got. Yeah, it's one thing too, you know, and you were his teammate for several years. It's one thing if you're striking out eight and walking seven. All right. Right. Um, it's another thing when you you can't hit water from a boat out there. No. Okay. That's exactly you're not right. challenging hitters at all on any level, you know? Um quickly on the NBA, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, this was oh. the big NBA news from over the weekend. The Lakers have formally shut down LeBron James. Uh, now that they're out of the playoffs, they just told him just to sit the rest of the season out. They've got uh, two weeks left. Now they're trying to acquire the best draft lottery odds they can. I don't think there's much of a chance. I mean, unless the unless the NBA draft lottery is really fixed, I don't think there's much of a chance they get Zion Williamson uh, or R.J. Barrett with the number ones or number two picks. But do you think... From you know your experience being on championship teams and around and being a championship player and being around them, this season, if no one, if if anybody would have come out in October when the season started, any handicapper, any analyst, and said this is how I'm going to forecast the Lakers season to go, they all would have been laughed right out of right. Vegas, right off right off of ESPN, and yet it all actually happened. It's almost tough to believe it watching it. You know what I'm saying? It's it's like watching the you know it's like when I went and watched the Justice League movie a couple of years ago, and I'm sitting there watching. I'm like, how do you f this up? How does 
How does, yeah. how does it suck? How do you do that? Like, I couldn't believe I was watching it suck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This well, is what it was I, been like watching the Lakers. So is this an outlier or an omen, Kurt? What do you think? Well, I'm going to start on the player angle first because I, I tweeted out when I saw this that basically LeBron James just mailed it in. Uh, I played with guys who did this. <clears throat> and I find it funny that the entire year LeBron James basically coaches himself. Mm-hmm. When I'm going to play, when I'm not going to play, what I'm going to do, who you're going to bring in, who you're going to bring out. All of a sudden now, the team is dictating that the season's over. You think for a second if he didn't want, if he wanted to be playing, exactly. he would be playing? That's a great point. Yeah, it's a great point. He didn't, and 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 he I got, told he told them, "I'm done." Yeah, that's I'm, exactly I'm shutting what happened. it down. Yeah, exactly what happened, and 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 that resonates deeply and profoundly in the clubhouse. Uh, you, dude, you're going to leave us out here all by ourselves. Especially with a lot of the young ourselves. players they have on that roster right now. You're going to leave us out here by ourselves to to, mm-hmm. to, to wallow in this. I mean, that, that don't don't miss that. Um, I don't see this going well. Uh, this relationship, I really don't. I, I just think that, and and I think it's, a lot of it's going to fall on the Lakers. Mm. You enable a player to do the things. This is very much Manny in Boston. When you allow things to go and get to a certain point and you don't impede the childishness of a player, at some point the other players look around and go, What the hell? And you're why, setting why? him up, you're setting him up to fail too. What, right? Why are there rules for 24 of us? Yeah. And, and, and here's the here's the thing. I accept the fact that there's a rule for that 25th guy when he's that good. Right. When he's not that good. Yeah. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. And and listen, LeBron's still good, but is LeBron still the, the I'm guaranteeing you guys a, a chance at the finals every year kind of a guy? Because if he's not, then the whole rule changing stuff stops. Well, it goes back to the question, the point about this last time we talked about it last week, and we'll close with this. I mean, um, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, uh, uh, you look at uh, Michael Jordan, Mag- Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Bird. Uh, Kobe Bryant, those are five, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, those six yep. players right there. If they played the same amount of games LeBron James played, this season for the Lakers. Would the Lakers have a better record than they do right now? And I think we in think the answer instance, in Oscar Robinson, instance. let's throw a seventh guy in there. I think Michael the Jordan. An, uh, we did throw Jordan in there. I think the answer every, is, every is, is yes. In every instance, you know, so there's, there's, uh, that's why I wonder if, if this is a marriage that cannot be saved. You know, yeah. July is going to tell us a lot what their ability, who wants to go and deal. If you're 25 year old, Anthony Davis, ask yourself this question. Is that, do I want to put my career in his hands? All right. That's what, especially when there's other matches I could make, you know, um, well, that, hey, that, that would get me closer year, to a championship. When my job on the court next year is dependent on whether one of my teammates likes me or not. Right. That's a problem. Yeah. That, I mean, look at Kyrie Irving is a great example yep. of that. Great stuff. All right, Kurt. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, buddy. Take care.